I, I don't know about you all, but I get nervous on Easter. I know a lot of you guys, I have maybe not even heard me before. That's such a, a big Sunday, such an important thing today to be able to stand up in front of you all and tell you that Jesus is alive and he's risen. But, you know, I got some wise words from my, my good friend David Miner before the uh, service today. It kind of helped me to realize, you know what, I'm not going to be nervous because I got a great job right now. I get to stand up here and tell you some great news. I think I'm blessed by that. Great job again to the choir. Great job to everybody that's been a part of this service. Great job to you all for being here today to worship God. And we've been going through a series here recently called Jesus says. And you can kind of see where we're going with this today when you look in your bulletin and look at the outline. But we'll get to what Jesus says today in just a minute. But first, let me ask you something. Have you ever people watched or watched something from afar, from a distance? I used to go to Reds games with my mom all the time. And I'd sit over there with the scorecard. Yes, I'm a Cubs fan, but I'd be at the Reds games keeping score. Who got a single? Who's on first? What's on second? I was on third, or however that old Brian goes. And I would, I would sit there and fill it out. I'd be really into the game. I could tell you what was going on with every play. And my mom would be like, you see that? I'm like, what? Yeah. 6-4-3, double play. Mom, yeah, of course I saw it. No, no, no. Did you see what that guy over there in that section over there just did that kid? <laughs> did you see that vendor over there, what he just said? She was always watching people. That just kind of she she and she knew she was guilty of it. She also watched the games. Let me not forget to say that. I know she'll probably watch this later. We've all done that though, haven't we? From time to time when we're in a big crowd, kind of people watch. Or just watch something from a distance. You you guys that are Wildcat fans got to be a part of something very special this year. Very special. 38, no. I know they didn't go as long as you guys wanted them to. And I hope you realize Duke is going to win the national championship. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I'm going to say about it. You were a part of something special. But you watched it You watched it from a distance. Now, sure, some of you guys went to games. And you might have been a little bit closer. But you still watched it from a distance. Kind of see what was going on. See what was happening. It still felt like you were a part of something special. And you should be. You should be proud. And I say, I say stay proud. Stay proud of your team. We've all done that. We've all been there. That's exactly what Jesus' disciples did. He told them, he quoted scripture from Zechariah. He said, when, when the, the shepherd goes down, the, the sheep are going to scatter. And that's exactly what happened. Judas came in that night in that garden. Give, give Jesus that infamous kiss. That kiss of death, if you will. To say, this is the man. This is the one they're calling Jesus. And when the soldiers came in, they might have put up a little bit of resistance, but soon the disciples scattered. Just like Jesus said they were, save two, Peter and John. And Peter and John would follow Jesus, and we know what would happen with Peter. We're going to talk about it more in detail next week. He'd eventually deny Christ three times before that rooster crowed. And he would also scatter. John would kind of follow along, watching from a distance. The other disciples that had scattered, they might have also seen, but even from a farther distance away. That's what we've got to make sure we don't do in our Christianity. We've got to make sure we're a part of it. We've got to make sure that we follow a preacher friend of mine, Earl Winfrey from Georgia. He probably said it best, a sermon he, he preached last week that I was blessed to listen to. He said, follow Jesus all the way. All the way. Not just till the time the soldiers come, not just till the time it gets rough. Following it all the way. But yet, the disciples, not doing that. They were watching from a distance whenever they nailed our Lord to the cross. They were watching from a distance when they put Him up there. And as He began to die, they were watching from a distance when Jesus said, Father, forgive them. <coughs> forgive them. For all, all the things that had just happened, and all the pain that he must have been in. And he says, Father, forgive them. Wow. Wow. That's pretty powerful, I think. Because why, why did we need forgiven? Because of our sin. Not his sin. He was perfect in every way. 
He hadn't sinned at all. But our sin. Hebrews 4.15 Jesus was at all points tempted like we are, yet was without sin. He was at all points tempted like we are. Think about that for a second. Have you ever had temptation in your life? I think every single one of us have to answer yes to this. There's no doubt. Of course we have. Think of sins that we are tempted by every day. Money, greed, sex, lust, pride, power. All things that Jesus had right in front of him that he could have taken. But yet, he was without sin. He didn't fall short. He didn't fail. He didn't sin. That is awesome. That's what made him the ultimate sacrifice. That's what gave us a chance at reconciliation to God. Because God came down himself as God the Son and was sinless. It's pretty amazing. 1 Peter 2, 22-24 tells us a little bit more about that. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. No lying, no lying going on here. No deceit, no sin. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Talking about God the Father. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Now, look at this verse for a second. He himself bore our sins. He, he bared them. He took them on for us. All of our sins are forgiven through this one moment in time where Jesus ultimate sacrifice for us. He carried it for us on that cross so that we might live. That we might live. And think about this. Think about how painful this must have been. I'm not talking about the punishment that we're going to talk about that point too. I'm not talking about the physical pain. I'm talking about the pain of sin. Because the true pain of sin is guilt. Man, oh man, sin can make you feel guilty. There's no doubt about it. And, and if you don't feel guilty when you sin, maybe you've got some pride issues. It's time to recognize the fact that we're all flawed. Shame and sorrow. Man, you ever just mess up and just feel bad about it? I think again, we all have. We've had to. Sin's going to cause us to fail. Be disappointed and disgusted with ourselves and others. That's the pain of sin that Christ bore on the cross for us. All these things in this one moment are <coughs> done. And that's not even to mention our punishment. See, Christ took our punishment for us, didn't he? That was me that should have been up on that cross. That was you. It wasn't him. I'm flawed. I've failed. I've sinned. You are flawed. You failed. You sinned. That would have been our just punishment, not his. But let me ask you something. Have you ever been unjustly punished? Most of us can probably, at least in our own opinions, say yes to this question. Yes, it wasn't fair. I got treated poorly. I got punished and I shouldn't have. It was somebody else's fault. We justify it, don't we? We try to say it's on somebody else, not us. It's a picture of Rosa Parks. Someone who we all know was unjustly punished. All because she wanted to sit in the front of the bus. And she wasn't allowed to because of the color of her skin. That's not just. There's nothing just about that. I think we all know that. But we could all probably have our own stories of unjust punishment. When I was in high school. Okay, before I tell this story, who did dumb things there in high school besides me? Seriously? Not you guys? The whole Johnson family was perfect in high school. <laughs> okay, okay. I was not. I can tell you that. I know they're teasing with him. But, uh, of course. 
I'm in high school. I'm at a, I'm at a hotel on a band trip. All right. And I got a couple friends. And I tell them that I think it'd be funny if they ran around this entire hotel, running around the entire thing, acting like Indians, screaming, and they have to be just in their boxers. <laughs> Brad and Craig, I hope you watch this. <laughs> and of course, they did it. I didn't do it. I was innocent. Here's where it comes into play, where I felt unjustly punished. As they're going around the corner, our band director comes out. I happen to be far, far enough behind them that he didn't see me. He just saw them. And the words out of his mouth were, there goes that Sweeney clan causing trouble. <laughs> I said, uh, excuse me, here I am, not doing anything, just kind of walking. And he said, yeah, Mike, but I'm not stupid. I know you put him up to it. He was absolutely right. But really, there's no unjust punishment there, is there? I was, for sure, a part of that in some, in some fashion, in some way. Just some kids having fun. But you get the point of what I'm saying. We all, at some point, think we've done something that we've been unjustly punished for. Maybe that's even the case. Maybe, that's it. Maybe you really haven't done it, and you're getting punished for it. Think about this. How many times you get away with something? How many times did you deserve more punishment? How many times, how many times did that happen? But we easily forget about that, don't we? Let's talk about this unjust punishment, though, that our Lord was getting. See, He was falsely charged. And when you're falsely charged, or even if you are rightfully charged, these two words are going to come into play. When someone is accusing you of something, especially something you didn't do, you are going to be stressed. And you can sit there and say, I don't care what people say. I don't care what... Yes, you do. Yes, you do. If you, don't, if you don't care what people say and think, you probably wouldn't have said that. Yes, you do. Rejection. Another thing that you're going to feel. Because you, didn't, you don't feel like you, you're deserving of this. Now think about our Lord. He's come, he's come to earth. He's left, he's left heaven. And He's come down for us. And He has tried through His entire life. And he has tried most specifically during his ministry the previous three years to teach us about love, to teach us about forgiveness. And yet here he is on this cross. You better believe there was some stress, stress involved. And most certainly there was rejection. Here Jesus is telling us about love and forgiveness. And here he is on this cross because mankind rejected that love, that forgiveness. But there was more to it than that. Matthew 27, 27 through 31. I'm going to read this one to you. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire battalion. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They made a crown of long, sharp thorns and put it on his head. And they placed a stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him, mocking and yelling. Hail, king of the Jews. And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and beat him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe, put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. They mocked him. They spit on him. They beat him. And then they nailed him to a cross. That was our punishment. That was our punishment he took. He didn't deserve that. He was definitely being unjustly punished. But he did it for us. Because you see, he took on our sins and he took on our punishment so we could have our forgiveness. Now think about this for a second, okay? In that one particular moment, the most important thing that's ever happened in all history of the world, when Jesus was dying on that cross, he bore the sins of the entire world. The entire, the entire world's sins are, are on his back, are on his shoulders right then. That's the power of the cross. That's where our sins go to die. With him. I'm so glad we have a Savior. 
that took on our sins for forgiveness. And I want you to think about something. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But you know what? He wasn't just saying that for them. I mean, these people had literally beat him and spit on him and mocked him and hurt him physically. But he didn't just do it for their sins. He also did it for us. See, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, He wasn't just talking to the soldiers. He was also talking to you and me. He was saying, Father, forgive Mike. He doesn't know what He does. Every time we sin, when we're forgiven by Christ, our sin's going to die on that cross. For them, for us, forgiveness. I say amen to that. Then later on in Matthew 27, 54, after Jesus had said, Father, forgive them, the soldiers said this statement. Truly, this was the Son of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I got news for you. They were wrong. Yeah, they were most definitely wrong. There is no was about it. What they should have said was truly, this is the Son of God, because death could not defeat him. Oh, no, no, no. He was going to go in that tomb for a very short amount of time, and he would raise from the dead. He would be with us once again. Truly, this is the Son of God. But why do they say that? Because of all the things he had been through. Mocked, spit on, tortured. And he still says, Father, forgive them. Oh, yes, truly, this is the Son of God. Who took on our sin, who took on our punishment, who has given us our forgiveness, and gives us the chance at our resurrection. You see, they took him off that cross, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They put him in that tomb, and they closed that tomb up. But guess what happened? And yeah, you know, because you're here today, he's alive. Amen. That tomb was opened up, Jesus walked out. He is risen. He lives. These are some of the things that we love to say on this day, but these are the things that we need to remember every single day. Monday through Sunday, 365, 24-7, every minute of every day, we need to remember that Christ arose and that He lives for us. How blessed are we to have a Lord that would come down to earth. Defeat temptation. Be sinless. Take on our sins. All the, the pain and the shame and the guilt. Take on our punishment that we deserved. And yet still, still say, Father, forgive them. Guys, I plead with you today. Accept this forgiveness. He has laid out a plan of salvation for us in His good book. He's asked for us to obey what He has said. Repent and be baptized. If you haven't done these things, if you're still waiting, I say why? Don't put it off any longer. Make today the day that you can say, He lives for me. His forgiveness is for us. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so very, very much for forgiving us. Lord, we fail. We fall short. We're sorry. Lord, we know that you're always there to help us back up, to pick us back up, to get us on our feet and say, you're forgiven. Lord, no matter what was happening to you, being spit on, being crucified, you still so willingly loved us so much and forgave us. Lord, most of all, today, on this Resurrection Sunday, we thank you for just that. For fulfilling your promise. Because Lord, we know that your promise wasn't just that you would die for us, your promise that you would rise again for us. Thank you very much for that, Lord. I ask the Lord right now a blessing upon all that are here. Help them to go today and to continue to celebrate you. 
continue to worship you. And Lord, if there's any here today that haven't accepted your forgiveness, who haven't acknowledged that you live, I ask right now that you will touch your heart, their hearts. We ask all these things in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ.